And we are recording this and it will get posted uh, to our webpage when the seminar is over. Um, let's see. Since we're doing this seminar remote, oh, this is the second of nine ground truth seminars running through December 14th. Since we are, are all doing this remotely, the speaker will use a pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific points on the slides because we can't see the where the arms are pointing to. And to help with this format, please mute your audio and turn off your video feed to avoid additional distractions. Also, Liz, uh, please keep your questions for the end of the seminar so the speaker isn't interrupted or type them into the chat box and Liz and I will compile them. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind people to join us for next week's speaker, Carolyn Sine from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, who will talk about filling science gaps in response to an unprecedented increase in redfish biomass in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. This will be held at the same time. Uh, next Tuesday, October 19th. So for today's speaker, Jim Thorson leads the Habitat and Ecological Processes Research Program at the Alaska Fishery Science Center, which involves envision envisioning future research and partnerships regarding essential fish habitat and loss of sea ice. He hopes to encourage further synthesis of direct and impacts of fishing on population status and productivity. He also collaborates with researchers in all AFSC divisions to integrate monitoring, process research, and modeling efforts to respond to ongoing changes in climate and research a resulting habitat. Today, Jim will tell us about the grand challenge for habitat science, synthesis of fishing effects, stage structure dynamics, and movement. Yeah, thank you, um, Mark and Liz. Uh, clearly, I wrote that um, that bio while I was multitasking. I'm not sure it syntactically made a lot of sense at points, but uh, you get the idea. And I hopefully have met many of you since I started um, about three years ago at the Alaska Center. Um, before I forget, I uh, you know I've 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 had the privilege of uh, learning a great deal about the Alaska Fishery Science Center and learning about our, you know, diverse and well-integrated research regarding habitat. Um, you know, part of that is supported through the essential fish habitat um, request for proposals that um, HEPR administers with funding from the regional office and the Science Center every year. That um, RFP is due at the end of this month. It's about $350,000 a year, 350 or more. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm excited to talk with people now or later about uh, proposal ideas. Um, yeah, so I'll be noting co-authors in each of three sections. And, you know, the intent of this is to kind of continue a conversation with the group about, um, you know, how we can essentially, you know, how we can connect habitat science with all the other science occurring at the center and how we can do it in a way that is impactful to management and therefore likely to kind of continue to get well funded. Um, you know, so, so I've been calling this the grand challenge for habitat science and I've got a few kind of toy demos, not of sort of how to solve the grand challenge, but of, of kind of approaches that colleagues and I have kind of taken to kind of pick at the sides of it. So, um, thank you everyone. Let's see if I can, uh oh, so now I can put an arrow, but I can't go forward. Does anybody, um, I should have tested the page forward thing before. In the okay. lower left hand corner. Oh, there we go. We That's it. fine. As long as I get rid of the annotation, it looks like I can do it. I, um, there's no need for me to annotate anything. So I'll just ignore that. Um, yeah, so, um, as I said, I'll, I'll start out by introducing what I've been calling the grand habitat challenge. Um, and then these kind of two little toy demos, one about um, individual fine scale movement and one about um, how anybody at the center could pick up our um, extensive stomach content data and use it to complement what they're doing for habitat. So, um, yeah, first up is this paper that was published last year with co-authors Al Herman at PML, Kevin Suwicki at ABL and Mark, um, Mark Zimmerman here um, at GAP. Um, 
the grand challenge for habitat science, stage structured responses, non-local drivers, and mechanistic associations among habitat variables affecting fishery productivity. So um, I guess my my cartoon is that we, over decades, we at the Alaska Center and also many other science centers have been doing these sort of um, pressure indicator response approaches to habitat studies. So um, we'll typically do a, a, a first set of studies that look at sort of impacts of fishing on, you know, on habitat features. It could be, you know, benthic infauna, it could be structure forming invertebrates, you know, corals and sponges. It could be mangroves, you know, impacted by development. Each of those, you know, typically we'll do, um, you know, either an observational study about impacts or we'll do, um, you know, some kind of experimental backy before after control impact design for a given type one and type two error rate to detect a significant impact on on a feature of habitat. And then um, if we find a significant impact, we then um, try to associate that feature that's impacted with resulting density of juveniles for mangroves or condition of fish for structure forming invertebrates or hodgepodge of things for benthic infauna. Um, and, and, and so this sort of two stage approach, I mean, it's, it's, first of all, it's subject to all sorts of kind of user error in the 1st study. It takes experts to, you know, it takes a lot of brilliance to set up a design to detect impacts on, on, on these, um, habitat variables. Um, you know, and then it, a second study is required that is often, um, also very difficult to design. So, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm not aware in the Alaska region of, you know, of any empirical study having definitively demonstrated fishing impacts on structure forming invertebrates, you know, in fauna or, you know, near shore habitat. You know, instead, we assume something a priori about that, which is a reasonable assumption. And then we um, are still putting a lot of work into this, this second type of study about how in, you know, these structure forming invertebrates will affect condition. It supports a lot of interesting science, but we haven't finished this stack for any single um, pressure indicator response. And so our capacity to inform management is limited. And of course, the problem is that, you know, things are way more complicated. So, um, you know, fishing is not just, in, you know, impacting habitat variables. Um, it's also, you know, it's, it's impacting, um, predators shown here with this cute little orca. Um, you know, humans are simultaneously doing this unreplicated experiment of ocean warming. Um, and all of these are kind of matric matriculating through as direct and indirect impacts. Um, and we are responsible, you know, ethically and also in its statute to assess all of these. In essential fish habitat. And so, um. Just to think this through, you know, fishing could result in, um, you know, many things, some of them are listed here, kind of categorized and, you know, here's how you could study it, you know, so fishing could re result in depleted benthic communities that could result in less benthic forage and structure and, and affect change, you know, fish productivity. And that's essentially the kind of main thrust that we've been doing in the SDM species distribution models and the fishing effects model at the Alaska Center. You know, fishing could also result in a depleted midwater surface community, resulting in less pelagic forage and changing fish productivity. It could result in less nursery habitat, resulting in less recruitment. Um, those are all indirect or habitat mediated effects, you know, but of course, um, my claim is that, you know, we, we also could be studying direct kind of exploitative effects. So, um, you know, instead of doing this two stage study of looking at fishing on in fauna or um, structure forming invertebrates or near shore habitat, we could look at direct localized depletion of fish in good or poor habitats. Um, you know, and how that changes the distribution among good and poor quality habitat and how that affects resulting, um, you know, per capita growth rates or productivity rates for the populations that we manage. Um, you know, fishing also directly affects the composition of target and bycatch species. Um, and that results in changing um, potential for attainment um, given management limits. And so, you know, a lot of times, you know, when people talk about habitat effects, 
in our management system, it's, you know, it's about closures. It's about like the Red King Crab closure area in Bristol Bay. And for instance, that closure is affecting the composition of target bycatch species. It's affecting the attainment given our management limits. Um, and, you know, so that's a direct or exploitative effect of fishing on productivity for these different species. You know, that's not the type of habitat research that everybody wants to do, but that is a type of habitat research. Um, and it's a, you know, one that could be done much more directly than the kind of two stage study that we have been doing. Um, so, you know, to think this through, you know, I, I guess this grant habitat challenge is specifically to try to formalize a framework for thinking about how localized um, management decisions, you know, decisions about fishing affects population wide productivity. And to think that through, you know, there's sort of two schools that we use here at the Alaska Center. One is sort of how we do stock assessments. Um, and so in this, in this case, we have a state based production model for the North Sea. This is a, a paper on fish and fisheries that's um, continuing to kind of affect things in Europe. And, um, you know, at the bottom here, we have these sort of fits to data for two stocks. And um, we can define stock status for these two with respect to different targets. Um, and, you know, the tradition of doing stock assessment is to have um, a, a model. You know, we have data, we have process research, and it connects through a model to management um, in which we are trying to understand changes in biomass over time as affected by density dependence, environmental responses, and sort of the direct offset of exogenous fishing. And, you know, so we have, you know, the effect of current biomass, environmental predictors X, and sort of a human impact C affecting changes in biomass. By contrast, in habitat, we often um, propagate our, you know, monitoring and process research through these species distribution models or SDMs, and they're used widely in ecology. Um, they include fine scale variation covariates, um, and, and they're usually the response is biomass, not a change in biomass, and it just predicts that based on um, environmental responses. So it doesn't directly represent harvest or impacts. And it doesn't directly represent density dependence. So, um, you know, research in the last five, 10 years has generalized both of these, have kind of combined them to have a, a, a process that looks at changes in biomass um, at each location S, S1, S2, S3, or three different locations or grid cells in a raster. And um, the change in biomass is predicted by local density by local catch and environmental variables with an estimated environmental response. And so, you know, this has all the variables of both a stock assessment model and a species distribution model. Um, and it could, you know, be used to define, you know, targets and a stock status at each location within a stocks range. So I've been calling this the, the spatial biomass dynamics model. And it's sort of a conceptual model to support this grand habitat challenge. Um, of course, this sort of cartoon doesn't do a lot of things that we might actually want it to do. Um, I'm sorry, this is a slightly old slide. I kind of reduced this down to three. One of them is stage structured effects. You know, we know that fish have um, demographic rates that vary with size, and that the size structure provides useful information. We have non-local effects like individual movement and ecological or environmental teleconnections that are not accounted for in that kind of simple um, spatial biomass dynamics kind of conceptual model. And then there's a bunch of questions about how do you attribute changes to direct and indirect pathways and how do you predict into counterfactuals like novel climate conditions. And so each of these is a challenge to that sort of simple cartoon model that, I, that I'll talk about how a person could deal with. So the first is this sort of idea of stage structured responses. And just to give a concrete example, here's um, different uh, variables that we've produced for Pacific Ocean perch at the Alaska Fishery Science Center. At the, um, the top is um, juvenile occupancy and density. The bottom is adult density. And then the right hand side is adult growth potential. So, um, you know, each of these has a different sort of monitoring design, a different analytic design, and then, re, you know, results in a prediction. 
Um, but of course, you know, if we want to talk about POP and how, you know, for instance, like, you know, a new uh, shipping route or a new fishing operation or a proposed, you know, oil pipeline um, could affect POP or any other species. We don't want to think about how it affects juveniles separate from adults. We want to think about how it affects POP as a whole. Um, and so we have to kind of integrate across these different efforts. And so, um, oh, shoot. Um, I thought I updated this slightly. Okay, that's fine. Um, an alternative approach is to, um, you know, basically define these rates at each location. And so, um, as I showed, we could have, um, you know, we could have information about survival across space, or maybe we assume that it's constant across space is kind of a null hypothesis. We often measure length at age across space and weight at length. We have direct measurements of, we could um, have some information about reproductive output, you know, maybe not for POP, but for some species, we have information about, um, you know, egg production as a function of individual size. We have information about skip spawning for some species. And so in some cases we could fill in information about this and other ones we can't. Um, and then finally, like reproductive survival and infection, you know, sometimes we have a model product, like an individual based model. You know, people don't always agree about the individual based models we have, but it is a, a basis for um, trying to link up, you know, production, you know, in the southeast and how that might might affect the, you know, recruitment in, in the central Gulf of Alaska. That's a bad example, but just just a hypothetical. So, once we have all these different sort of rates defined at every location across the, in this case, the Gulf of Alaska. We could either combine them by calculating an intrinsic growth rate of, you know, little r. Um, at every location by making a Leslie matrix at each raster cell and little, little r, um, you know, is, is dimensionless and it's sort of a common currency that's often used in ecological theory to think about, you know, sustainability and, um, persistence at a community level. And so that, you know, that could be a, you know, a common metric for defining EFH that integrates across life stages and demographic rates. Alternatively, in some species, maybe we can parameterize an individual-based model with all of this, the full, a full life cycle individual-based model that you run to equilibrium, and then you can define a production um, at every location as the change in total abundance that would occur if you eliminated that. Um, so you could do kind of a sensitivity analysis on that IBM to get at how important every location is. Um, in terms of uh, non-local effects, I'll talk first about this, and then we'll talk about movement in a minute. Um, you know, I and others have been thinking a lot about kind of ecological teleconnections. You know, so essentially how um, how to use observational data to look at how something at one location affects density or productivity at other locations. One way to do these sort of, you know, estimate these the teleconnections is to, um, I mean, that, that was developed originally by physical oceanographers, you know, and atmospheric scientists is to fit these sort of empirical orthogonal functions. Um, so in this case, if you fit an EOF um, to bottom trawl data in the Eastern Bering Sea, you get um, sort of a mode of variability that pops out of the data. That mode of variability is highly correlated with cold pool extent, even though that cold pool wasn't explicitly in the model. Um, it pops out because each of these species has sort of an idiosyncratic response to, um, you know, wintertime sea ice production and resulting cold pool extent. You know, whether it's a direct effect or whether it's because of how cold pool affects the timing of copepod diapause or, you know, the, um, the strength of the, you know, Bering Sea green belt, you know, it doesn't exactly matter. The point is that there's this kind of synchronous ecological teleconnection that's simultaneously affecting productivity across a whole landscape. And so in this study, we kind of walk through how each of these species has a, you know, a response to cold pool. Um, you know, and show sort of how to estimate these sort of teleconnections. And then, um, finally, the, the third one is about sort of how do you do, um, how do you deal with multi-causality? Like, how do you deal with the fact that there's a bunch of things that are changing all at once? And so, um, you know, a person might wonder, you know, are copepods more important than other forage for winter 
young of year, age zero pollux neuro, you know, growth. Um, you know, and is RNA DNA hypothetically a better proxy for um, you know for foraging success than morphometric condition? And so in this case, you know, you, you end up with a bunch of these different sort of um, sort of you know variables that you can measure. Here I'm showing kind of nine related to an age zero pollock foraging module. Um, and essentially, you're trying to estimate the strength of different arrows shown on this, like um, how much do copepods versus krill affect, um, you know, a direct measurement of, you know, forage success in terms of stomach energy densities. Um, and then how much are, are stomach energy densities, which is sort of expensive to measure, how much can that be um, indirectly measured? using RNA DNA me measurements or morphometric condition or bomb calorimetry or whatever it else it is. So um, in this case, there's something called a structural equation model. And um, basically it's sort of um, a matrix of effects. So you form this matrix in the bottom, um, the bottom right, where some variables are thought to have no effect on other variables. For instance, you might have um, water clarity is assumed to not have any causal effect on surface temperatures. They might both be driven by the same thing, but ignoring that for now. Um, you might think that water clarity has no direct effect on stomach energy densities, except via krill or copepod or other prey densities. And so anytime you know that there's no direct causal effect, you put in a zero, and then you basically come up with a list of, of, of hypotheses, hypothesized direct interactions or causal effects and, and try to estimate those coefficients. And um, you can do that using what's called a structural equation model. I've got some of the math up above. We don't really need to go into it, but um, it's basically a way of parameterizing a covariance matrix and then fitting it um, as a likelihood model. So, um, you know, and I can share the script for showing how to do this, um, how to generalize structural equation models in this way, if anybody's interested. So, um, and then finally, you know, these kind of conceptual questions we have, like, are copepods more important than other forage for winter or young of year growth? You could end up asking questions about, like, oh, is the direct effect of copepods on stomach energy density, is that coefficient greater than the coefficient for krill on, um, Age zero stomach density, you know, age, age zero um, prey densities in a stomach. Um, you know, and is RNA DNA a better proxy than morphometric condition? Again, you could express that as sort of a comparison of, of coefficients in this model. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a, a, a you know a quick description of this sort of challenge that I want to set up. Um, how do how how do we want to predict the impact of localized human activities on population scale productivity? You know, my suggested approach is to combine concepts from stock assessment and habitat analysis to directly include proxies for human impacts. You know, caches, habitat disturbance. Um, you know, condition your predictions on current environmental, current and future environmental conditions, and um, do you know include both of those to predict changes in habitat specific, specific productivity? So those are the kind of things that are included in that conceptual, that sort of spatial biomass dynamic model. And um, of course, doing it that way results in many, you know, very obvious challenges. Um, you know, so stage structured responses we can resolve by assembling stage specific habitat responses and synthesizing across them. <laughs> using a common currency, um, you know, non-local responses, we can either explicitly model movement or identify modes of variability resulting from ecological teleconnections. And, you know, mechanisms, these kind of multi-causal or these kind of multiple things that are changing at once, mechanisms that link environmental variables, we can resolve using structural equation models. Um, you know, or, you know, using essentially like a regional ocean model, ROMs, as a structural model for the relationship between environmental variables. So, um, 
you know, hopefully that shakes loose some ideas for people. Next, I'm um, going to move to the kind of toy, two toy examples, you know, that again, don't sort of solve this grand habitat challenge, which would take effort, concerted effort from <coughs> people across, <laughs> across the center. Um, but instead, these are just kind of demos of sort of how some of the concepts could be could be tackled. So, in this case, this is a, a paper that I did with, you know, Steve, Dan, Kelly Kearney, Ned, Julie, Matt, Siski, um, who's a postdoc at UW, um, Kevin again, and Grant Thompson. It's published in Fish and Fisheries this year, looking at high, high resolution movement rates um, estimated from environmental variables, tags, fishery CPUE, and surveys. And so, um, yeah, I tried to strip out a lot of the math here. Um, so I guess I want to start by pointing out that there's a lot of different data that's informative about movement. Um, there's conventional tags, you know, we at the Alaska Center have an amazing conventional tag data set. Um, you know, kind of like Floyd tags, they have low return rates, um, and they, you know, their return is dependent on fishing effort, but we can resolve those issues. We also have an amazing, um, database of surveys. Um, we have fishery CPUE, which requires some additional assumptions to interpret, but is, uh, season wide. We increasingly have a lot of archival tags and, you know, with the increase in, um, sable fish, you know, maybe we'll have a future in which we have more money coming out of our, um, uh, sable fish program for archival tagging. We increasingly have movement gates, you know, either weirs in freshwater systems or upward facing acoustics. And those, um, can basically measure the flux of individuals across a fixed location. We have selection studies, you know, so like Ben Laurel um, did a lot of work that I admire a, a, a lot about, um, you know, how different conditions will drive, you know, habitat preferences, um, you, you know, measuring those in the lab. We have chemical markers, you know, stable isotopes, you know, compared with an isoscape. We have genetic markers, parasite markers, and then finally, you know, stomach contents data. So we have this tremendous um, database of different ways of inferring movement. And we, I would say rarely, um, manage to spend the time to synthesize all of those in a formal way to kind of inform our, our management process in cases, you know, Cadillac cases, high priority cases, when we might want to do that synthesis. Um, you know, perhaps part, part of the reason is that conceptually you kind of need a framework to do all this. And so, um, you know, that's what we propose in this paper. We, um, we decompose an instantaneous movement rate M star. It's a move. It's a matrix representing a, a movement rate from every location, to every other location. And we decompose that into a diffusion process, like random movement away from, you know, kind of searching or unmodeled kind of individual movement away from where they are. Um, a taxis rate. So taxis is defined as sort of the movement towards preferred habitat and then a passive advection rate so um obviously you know um you know plankton by definition are going to be advected passively along the kind of um you know gradient field you know along the direction of um you know dominant currents and tidal currents um and so we could include, you know, but of course they can also modify that passive advection by vertical, you know, choosing vertical movement. So, um, in part, it's sort of a known advection rate and in other cases, you know, they can sort of modify that speed at which they move along that field. Um, yeah. And so once you have this instantaneous movement matrix M star, you can combine, you can integrate that across a, a known time interval um, using what's called a matrix exponential. Um, and so just talking about this a little bit, you know, instantaneously a fish is never going to move from one location and skip, you know, it always has to move through intervening locations, you know, so within a, um, an instantaneous movement rate, if you have a, a, a raster, if you have a grid, a fish can only move to an adjacent grid cell. When you integrate that instantaneous movement process across a time interval, 
and fish can there's a non-zero probability of them moving to other locations any other locations they don't need to be adjacent anymore um and so once you have that integrated um movement fraction matrix m you can use that to project your estimates of abundance from one year you know one time to the next time and so um in terms of math if the columns of that movement rate matrix sum to zero and all of the off diagonals are greater than zero, then that movement, that integrated movement matrix conserves abundance. It sums all of the columns sum to one and none of them are negative, like there's no negative fish in the world. So um, it's pretty straightforward math. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing that anybody who's used to doing R could learn how to do with, you know, a couple, five, eight lines of code. Um, the key here is that that um, that taxis process can be modeled from a habitat preference function. So, um, let's say you've got a set of habitat variables x. You know, so like Ned Lehman right now, you know, how is it, you know um, hosts um, these rasters of you know fee and bathymetry. You know, and we of course other people have developed all these products. You know, Mark and Bob McConaughey and many others. We then make sure they're all in the same resolution that we want to use as a community and we host, re, you know, reserve them on that kind of fixed projection. And so you could get a bunch of those variables and you could, you know, try to figure out, um, you know, is there a given sediment size fee that your fish prefers? Is there a given bathymetry that they prefer or temperature or whatever it is, you know, light level? Um, and so in this case, their preference is just the product of these environmental layers that we have measured, and then a bunch of unknown habitat preference coefficients, which I'm calling alpha. Um, so you can make this habitat preference function for every location, every grid cell G, and then taxis is just the difference between the habitat preference at one location or another. That's the, the taxis rate. Um, and that just goes into that um, that move that instantaneous movement rate. And so, taking kind of like a one-dimensional example here is sort of a, a, a little illustration of um, a, just a one-dimensional um, habitat along the x-axis. And in this case, we've got um, depth where it's getting deeper as you go from um, zero to six. And then there's a bottom temperature where um, it's coldest in the middle, and then just kind of making up some coefficients for this habitat preference in the top left, the, the resulting preference is shown in black. So it's half of the temperature plus the depth, but it just kind of prefers being in the left because it's kind of, you know, near zero because it's shallow and it kind of, um, or, or because it's, uh, let's see, because it's, low temperature or high temperature <laughs> like towards zero it's higher temperature it doesn't prefer being in the middle because it's low temperature and then on the on the right towards six it's deep and it's high temperature in this sort of made up example um and so it prefers to the, toward being towards six so um using that habitat preference we can define a diffusion matrix that's shown in b here a taxis matrix where it's moving from blue to red. Um, and then um, and then we can kind of solve at the bottom row, if they start at the gray bar in time zero, you can solve where they would end up after one time interval or three or 10 or an infinite number of time intervals. Um, as T goes to infinity, all of the, regardless of where they start out, they converge on this black, dashed line, which is the kind of stationary habitat utilization function. That's sort of their resulting distribution at a population scale. Um, and, you know, we can look at sort of how quickly they converge from their starting point on that distribution um, by comparing the red, the purple, and the blue across those different bottom panels. And so, you know, the point, there's a couple things to take from this. One is that, um, you know, we can connect habitat we can connect connect environmental layers like temperature and depth to a resulting stationary distribution that black line 
in the, in the top left in A looks a little bit, but not identical to the resulting utilization distribution shown as the black line in the bottom row. Um, they look similar, but not identical. Um, another point is that if we have an instantaneous movement process that we know or we estimate, we can then back out what's the utilization distribution, where, where on average would a fish of this population be? And, um, and we could use that utilization distribution, the black line in the bottom row, to define essential fish habitat if we, you know, or inform essential fish habitat. So, um, as an example, uh, co-authors and I applied this to Bering Sea Pacific Cod in the eastern and northern Bering Sea from 1982 through 2019 and looking at their distribution in two seasons, summer and winter. Summer, winter, and I, I forget how I set this up. It's like summer and then it'd be winter of the next year and then summer of the next year. You know, it's kind of an accounting thing, but. Um, and then the covariates we had, it was bathymetry and summer and winter bottom temperature for ROMs. Um, we had a summer bottom trawl survey and summer and winter long line fishery CPUE. We had conventional tags and then we had long line fishing effort as an offset for explaining tag recapture probabilities for those conventional tags. So, um, you know, we made a little toy, um, our package called um, ATM or Advection Taxis model that fits this model. And in this case, I put in like a spline effect of uh, bottom temperatures or bathymetry on habitat preference and, you know, fitted that spline response and then visualized it using these kind of standard R packages. Um, during fitting without doing it in a really formal way, um, I assumed that the bottom temperature response was the same between seasons, but, but the bathymetry response was different between seasons, kind of, you know, in some species that can make sense if they have like a summer versus winter, you know, summer feeding, winter spawning, um, bathymetry response. Although I don't claim that that's a great description of Pacific Cod. Um, so, you know, fitting this model and then looking at the estimates of um, what would happen if you release a tagged fish kind of near the, the pribs um, in different time, you know, in um, either in the left column and releasing it at the beginning of the summer of 2007 so that it goes through a cold stanza or releasing it at the same place. Um, at the beginning of summer 2014, so it kind of goes through a warm stanza um, and tracking it from the summer to the next winter, the next summer, and then a couple summers later. Um, the model is not kicking up a huge difference between summer, you know, warm and cold stanzas as shown by their resulting just, you know, predicted distribution over time. But there is some difference in their predicted movement between warm and cold. You know, the model also emphasizes that the population is not panmictic. Um, it takes a while for, you know, a cod to, um, you know, this sort of simulated cod to, um, diffuse. Um, I should say that these results are not <laughs> including information from our really informative, um, you know, electronic tagging studies. We could bring those in in the future, but, um, to avoid, avoid kind of stepping on toes, um, we chose to leave those data out. And so, um. In the future, this could be updated again with with really informative data. Um, you know, in this case, we can look at differences in habitat preference in summer and winter, and the model is predicting. You know, again, not claiming this is a great description of cod specifically, but it does show what the model can do. You know, it predicts sort of a um, a broad distribution in in winter for many of these years. Um, and then the predicted densities, in this case, log numerical densities in different years as well. And showing like, for instance, by 2017-18, a movement of densities up into the Northern Brown Sea. Um, we've got these sort of metrics of model fit that seem to do fine. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, and then, you know, once we have this high resolution movement process and this utilization distribution, we can do these kind of scenarios to think about how much 
you know, we can coarsen the resolution to look at the movement fraction from the eastern Bering Sea to the northern Bering Sea and from the northern Bering Sea back to the eastern Bering Sea. In general, if we coarsen this and look at kind of a two box movement fraction, we see that there's throughout this whole time a predicted very fairly low rate of movement from the EBS to NBS and a fairly high rate of movement back from the NBS if, if a cod got up there. But that movement from the NBS back to the EBS has dropped extended a lot over time. And that's what the model says is responsible for this kind of increase in the proportion of the population in the Northern Bering Sea. <coughs> um, we can do these sort of sensitivity experiments of excluding data. So if we drop out all the fishery data and look at movement from that same location in the Pribs, we get a picture of their utilization distribution and or their 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 movement after I think um, several years. <coughs> I forget exactly. Um, and it looks pretty similar to all the data. The um, proportional EBS looks similar. If we drop the survey data, by by contrast, the model really doesn't make any sense. You know, it's kind of wildly wrong about thinking that there was a lot of fish in the northern Bering Sea originally. And then finally, if we drop the tagging data, um, the the rate of movement is estimated way too low. Um, so even several years later, there's not much diffusion away from the pribs. And as a result, the um, the estimates of movement we can get from the you know movement between the EBS and NBS um, says that very few fish would have moved into the Northern Bering Sea in recent years, which again is sort of not consistent with what we think has happened. So, in this case, the survey and the tagging data are most important. The fishery CPUE is not not doing that much. Then finally, we can take this um, these course and movement fractions and plop them into this two box stock census model that Grant had proposed several years ago. And um, without movement, um, the proportion of the Eastern Bering Sea is shown in this gray line, and then the the dots are these sort of. Um, Best available science, you know, survey data estimates of the proportion of the NBS. Um, you know, and so the the gray line sort of is consistent with recent years where we think that there were a lot in the NBS, but of course we don't think that that was the case back in the 80s and 90s. Um, by contrast, if we take the movement fractions from this model and plug it into the assessment, it does a better job of thinking that the assessment model does a better job of um, you know, agreeing that there weren't many fish in the NBS in the past, but the movement rate constrains them not to move into the NBS that that quickly either. So, you know, neither the blue nor the gray line is really um, very satisfactory for stock assessment purposes. And we, um, I think, the plan team is in the SSC have consistently gone ahead with kind of a one box assessment model until we can get better information about you know better synthesis of movement perhaps by including electronic tags in a synthesis framework like this. So um, conclusions, you know, for people that maybe got lost in the math a little bit, you know, we have a ton of data at the Alaska Center, you know, different species have conventional archival tags, you know, survey and fishery CPUE, acoustic tags with autonomous detectors like sail drones for red king crab, we have genetic markers, we have movement gates, like acoustic telemetry or fine scale arrays. We have a lot of tracers, and then we've got kind of predators as samplers. Um, you know, John Pyatt talking about seabirds as samplers in the Aleutian Islands and so forth. So um, all of these are informative about movement. And um, if you care about movement in your species, I think that there's gonna be some combination of data that is informative, that it is, um, you know, for affecting management, it's worth trying to think about how to synthesize. So then finally, the the third case study, or the second case study, the final piece of this talk is um, work that revisions are back in review ecology, working with Yumi um, at USGS, Tal Levy at OSU, and Gretchen Roffler at AEF&G, and it's um, showing how to use dot, do, my, my, my belief is that anybody at the center should be able to do, you know, use our decades of stomach content data 
both from the bottom trawl and from, you know, surface trawls that EMA have collected, you know, ecofoci and EMA, um, to get insight about, you know, the foraging ecology of their, of their species. Um, and they can do that using generalized linear models. So if you can run a GLIM in R, you should be able to do stomach content analysis. So, um, you know, food habits data, again, you've got stomach contents, either from necropsies, you know, onboard capture and sorting, or, or you know, wrecks, like wash-ups of dead marine mammals. We've got behavioral observations, like bill loads for seabirds, and we've got kind of biogeochemistry, you know, stable isotope signatures and fatty acid markers. And each of these has, you know, some combination of, you know, visual, genetic, stomach temperature loggers, you know, electronic loggers, et cetera. So, We've got this sort of explosion of food habits data, similar to how a lot of other parts of our research are working now with electronics. Um, and so there's, you know, similarly a kind of need to expand how we do analysis and synthesis of stomach content data. So in the past, as I understand it, people a lot of times just did this sort of what to me, I will say seems like a silly approach of taking the percent frequency of occurrence um, just the average of data and um, treating that as the, um, you know, proportions of a diet. And so, um, of course, this has several problems. One of them is that um, spatially unbalanced sampling will cause bias. So, you know, if you're doing necropsies of washed up marine mammals, you know, those washed up mammals might be preferentially skewed towards ones that were close to shore and didn't sink. Um, you know, if you, uh, you know, a lot of people have unbalanced designs, you know, if you have seabirds and you're looking at their bill loads, um, that is only going to represent their foraging near that, near that area. And of course, what they bring back to their chicks, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to deal with this sort of unbalanced sampling that causes bias. Alternatively, people do this hierarchical expansion of post stratified samples. So, um, you know, I think that's how Reem has been doing, you know, the program Reem has been doing this for a long time with our stomach content. You know, we expand stomach samples in these sort of um, post-stratified boxes. Um, and then we combine those across space using the proportions of density in those boxes. Um, the problem with that, you know, is that it ignores fine scale heterogeneity. There might be um, clear differences between warm and cold water. And, and that's not built in in this post stratification. It also can't use continuous predictors very easily, like size or age. So a lot of times it's post stratified by space and by size. But of course, that ignores heterogeneity within the size bins. So, um, you know, people have tried to develop these ways of doing models, like a Dirichlet model. Um, this is kind of what, um, you know, Cam Ainsworth and, and folk have been doing. You can put in a mix of stratified and continuous predictors, but it requires modifying your data kind of a priori to fit zeros and ones, and it's hard to interpret. And then what I'm proposing and what I've got a little R package that I can share with people is to do this sort of Tweety generalized additive model where you can put in covariates. You don't need to modify the data and you can just run it as a glim in R. And so. The theory for doing this is that you've got, you know, foraging is essentially a point process. You've got, um, you've got some unknown, um, location for every prey. <coughs> and that's uh, a random variable. If you assume that, um, individual prey are independent random, the counts at a given, uh, location, a foraging location will follow like a, a Poisson process. A Poisson distribution. And then let's say every prey has a size mark. If that follows a gamma distribution, then you then you end up with what's called a Tweety. Um, a Tweety distribution is the, the total biomass of all of the prey that would have been encountered <laughs> in a given foraging trip. Um, and then let's say you've got some thinning process, like you've got some um, you know, predators encounter a prey but decide not to attack it or they fail in their attack rate, or they have some handling time. Those are all types of thinning in a point process. And so we, we can define foraging as a thinned and double marked point, point process. So conceptually, let's imagine we've got three different prey distributions where the location of prey, they each have their own distribution. 
um, shown in the top call, top row. And so every prey is, is a point and their size is the size of a point. Um, and then we've got three different kind of central place foragers shown in red, green, and purple. Um, so looking at those sites, um, the distribution of, um, of prey that they'd capture on a foraging trip around that location um, is shown in the second row. And then if we approximate those distributions as a Tweedy distribution, we get this sort of theoretical distribution shown in the third row. And then if, if we further um, approximate it using a Tweedy that we can fit really easily as a glim, that's the fourth row. And so basically the point being, without having the time to go through it in a whole lot of detail, that we can approximate this sort of individual based foraging process as a Tweedy generalized linear model. So why do we care about all this math? I mean, the, um, the point is that I think that, you know, everybody um, doing habitat research, I'm assuming will have some experience with ANOVA or, you know, basic kind of um, statistical kind of hypothesis testing methods. And I think increasingly there's sort of some convergence around using R for that because we can share it between people easily. And so if you can kind of take the next step of getting to fitting a glim in R, um, you know, you, I could share a package with you to, um, to fit stomach contents um, doing this. So um, the R package looks, or the R code needed for this looks like this. This is loading package and a package called MV Tweedy that is the Middleton Island Tufted Puffin stomach contents. I then, in this case, fit a GAM, um, which is in the second kind of row. Um, in this case, showing, um, let's see, this is an oversimplified example. It would be just showing a constant proportion for every group, prey group. Um, I can predict the response in this data frame out, and then I can visualize that using ggplot. Um, and so if I do this with a smooth, like smooth spline on year and visualize it, you can get these sort of temperature responses and um, prey <coughs> proportions for every prey species that is in this database. And what it shows is that um, at Middleton Island, the tufted puffins had this sort of early oscillation between Pacific sand lance and um, prow fish back in the 80s. And 90s. And then in the 2000s, more recently, there's been this sort of oscillation between Pacific herring and capelin, where um, herring has a higher proportion when temperatures are warm, and that's significantly positive. And both prowfish and walleye pollock have lower proportions, significantly lower proportions when it's when temperatures are cold. So in this case, we've got sort of a very simple glim kind of looking at prey proportions for tufted puffins. We did this for um, wolves in Southeast Alaska. I'm getting to the end here and I'm unfortunately running out of time, but here's sort of a landscape of um, prey utilization. And I just want to point this out. I should, I should update this figure. I'm sorry to any co-authors on it. Some of these islands don't have wolves on it, but um, you know, there are islands where their proportion in their diets is very high of marine mammals, other areas with beavers, other areas of fish. Um, you know, so their, their diet is, you know, highly um, context specific. So um, the point is you can fit food habits as a GAM or GLIM using kind of standard R packages. You can put in covariates affecting um, prey densities. And it's easy, you know, it's just as easy to do as a standard regression in R. So, um, you know, before getting to um, acknowledgements, you know, my basic message is that we can develop these density maps for species across life stages, including movement. I think that we should explore as a community direct impacts of human activities on um, habitat specific productivity. Um, so not just looking at impacts on habitat and then subsequent impacts of habitat on species, but looking at direct exploitative impacts um, and 
I would be very interested to talk with people about indirect impacts on forage using stomach contents. You know, we have, again, this whole buildup looking at in fauna um, in the fishing effects model, and we apply it to species that seem to have no association with in fauna. You know, that's the kind of thing that we could really quickly knock down by looking at stomach contents to kind of test our assumptions about whether in fauna will ever be a useful predictor of human impacts for, for a given species. So, um, putting up a list of um, co-authors here, and thanks again to Liz and Mark for organizing. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. And um, I meant to uh, add that uh, we tried to work you in last year and it just didn't work out. The logistics weren't there. It's nice to finally get to your uh, presentation this year. So thanks for your patience for that. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Is there anyone out there who wants to unmute their microphone and ask a question directly of Jim? While we're waiting for folks, I wondered, um, you know, it seemed like a lot of the data sets you're accessing are all sort of partial data sets in terms of space and time. And I wondered, um, that's a, it's a lot of adversity to overcome. Um, I wondered if you had any comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanna say again that like all of our science is a relay and so, you know, any of us in our lifetime are going to get kind of small data sets and do kind of small synthesis. And, you know, we just need to trust one another to give each other credit and to kind of get it to the audience. You know, none of us will succeed without sort of the willingness to kind of, you know, not just do our own analyses, but put them out there so other people can do them, you know. Um, I think we do that well at the Alaska Center, you know, as we, as one example, you know, we've got all this sort of electronic tagging data that will be incredibly informative about movement in the coming years. You know, I'm really appreciative of the groups that are doing that and how they 100% deserve kind of the first crack at sort of what those will mean. And then I'm excited about sort of, you know, opening up access to the whole community to think about how to use those. You know, once you kind of get that whole handshake, you know, that whole relay done the first time, it's much easier to show the value of it and then get funding for it again. And I might have seen a question pop up. <laughs> I have a mundane question. Um, is it possible to get a copy for us to have copies of your presentation? Because there's a lot of information on it. It's very information dense. <laughs> It would be nice to be able to look at it again. Yeah, well, th thanks for attending. And I, I think we're, yeah, I think there's a recording. Um, and of course, anybody could email me with my email at the top there too, to get a copy of the, of the presentation if they want that instead of the recording. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll just also, again, just remind people that the um, essential fish habitat RFP is coming up and um, there's still plenty of time to come up with new ideas and, and aim to submit them and feel free to reach out to me if you want feedback before doing so. Thank you, Jim. Oh, sorry. This is Megzi. I have a question that I typed in the Q&A, but I can just ask it out loud too. Yeah, go for it, Maxine. Actually, it's two questions. One is, can you send me a link to the MV Tweety package? And the second question is, a lot, I really like all of these like trophic interactions. It makes a lot of sense to me ecologically to include predation interactions into the, the characterization of, of predator essential fish habitat. And I'm wondering if there's a way like, how do you see those kind of short time scale interactions fitting into our like management structure for EFH, which in my understanding is like 
one snapshot every five years and these static maps that we provide in the reports. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, like, I think that there's sort of two, you know, basic uses for that sort of trophic information. You know, one is using predators as samplers, and I don't think we do that as much. John Pyatt's talked about that. You know, we've had some success kind of showing that credit, you know, ground fish are a good sampler of um, herring in the Northeast Center. Um, you know, and then the other one that we do more at the Alaska Center is using stomach content as a measure of trophic flow, you know, um, energy flow, carbon flow in multi-species models. Um, you know, in terms of the first one, you know, there are some species where maybe we have better information from predators as foragers than we have direct sampling information about their distribution. Um, so that's sort of the focus on the prey distribution. In other cases, like, you know, trying to characterize condition, you know, understand the, you know, suitability of habitat based on their sort of the energy density, you know, their, their foraging success at a given location. And then again, like trying to look at sort of habitat, you know, whether a good a place is a good or bad for a given focal species, you know, is going to be driven by how much predation there is. So, you know, like Northern fur seal recolonized and ate a lot of stuff around one of the pribs, you know, we probably have good stomach content data for that. And that could be, you know, that story could be played out in terms of essential fish habitat for whatever they're eating, you know, and, and I, I don't know the details enough to guess at whether it's important for crab and the cribs or what. Sweet, thanks. Thanks for the question, Nancy. And we've uh, went over our hour, so I think we'll end the general meeting there, but um, if Jim, if you're available for a few more minutes in case there are any other questions, maybe we can hang out for just a little bit. Thank you everyone for attending. Yeah. Yeah, and I and, and sorry, the other question was about MV Tweedy and the paper the paper's still in review. It'll obviously go live um when the paper gets accepted and I'll I'll send that. Um I'll just invite you to the private repo, Megzi, when I can we get off here for now. Awesome. That is great. I did a brief and frantic Google search for it while you were talking. <laughs> and this makes sense. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thanks everyone. Well, you're getting a lot of thank yous in the comments. And uh, so thank you so much, Jim. Uh, great presentation. And hopefully yeah. people can catch up with you directly if they um, want to chat more about all this. Sounds thank good. you. Thanks again. Yeah. Bye.